Uh, thank you, and uh, thank you for the uh, invitation. It's always a pleasure to, uh, to be able to engage in these types of uh, comparative discussions in, in the Nordic world. Uh, I think we have fairly similar starting points, and that makes it easier sort of to understand what's going on. Uh, and nevertheless, there are important uh, differences that makes it possible to, to learn from the experiences uh, that we have um, across the, uh, the borders in, in the Nordic region. Um, so I'm, I'm a professor at the University of Copenhagen uh, Political Science and uh, Public Health. Uh, so I am sort of in my daily job trying to, uh, to combine uh, both sort of a, a political organizational perspective on, on health systems and more sort of detailed research into uh, the structures and the way uh, and the operation of the, of the healthcare system. I'm also heading a, a center for health economics at the uh, University of Copenhagen so we're really trying to, to combine across uh, different uh, disciplines. I'm going to be talking today about uh, choice and integration in Denmark and Sweden. I'm going to be skipping back and forth between the two countries, but I'll try to be clear about uh, which country I'm talking about at, at, uh, the, uh, at the different points. Um, so starting with, uh, with the Danish uh, situation, um, this is just uh, one slide briefly describing the uh, structure of uh, the Danish healthcare system after a major reform uh, that took place in 2007. So you might know that, that Denmark uh, actually is, is uh, the one uh, Nordic country that has gone through uh, a major structural reform um, of the type that has been discussed in, uh, in Finland uh, recently, amalgamating the municipalities from <coughs> around 270 and down to now uh, 98 um, and similarly lumping together the counties uh, down to from from 13 and down to five uh, regions running uh, healthcare in the system so the five regions are responsible for hospitals uh, they are also responsible for primary care so that's different to the situation we heard in in uh, Norway recently uh, in Denmark we've chosen uh, a structure where we try to integrate the uh, primary care and the uh, hospital care uh, within the same authority in order to to achieve integration at that level. Um, obviously there are other integration issues as I'll come back to later because uh, lots of the elderly care, social care, etc. is being dealt with at the municipal level so in that sense uh, there's a need to, to integrate across administrative uh, boundaries uh, in, the, in the Danish system as well. But primary care consists, uh, as in Norway, of uh, private general practitioners operating under a national agreement which specifies the tariffs, uh, the working conditions, how, how they have to relate to the rest of the system and so on. And they're paid uh, a combination of capitation fee covering about a third and fee-for-service, so activity-based uh, payment uh, for the rest. And as in Norway, access to establish a practice is, uh, is regulated, or rather the, the situation is that you can establish a practice, but in order to get reimbursement from the public uh, purse, uh, you have to be registered. So, and, and the amount of uh, registered practices is fairly tightly controlled. And that's different to the Swedish reform uh, that I'm going to be talking about in a minute and different to some of the models being discussed in Finland. Um, in, in Denmark and Norway, we've uh, chosen to introduce choice but not introduce this freedom of establishment. So it's not a competition situation in, in Denmark and Norway uh, as is being discussed in, in Finland. And I think that's important to bear in mind as we move forward. So Denmark and Norway different from uh, Finland and Sweden in the sense that we don't have these, uh, these uh, healthcare centers uh, as, as the core structure, but rather we have these private actors or semi-private actors uh, of the GPs and practicing specialists. Hospitals in Denmark mainly owned by the regions. Uh, there are very few private hospitals. Some really are large clinics or sort of specialty uh, hospitals. Payment schemes uh, for the hospitals vary across the regions, so the five regions have some independence uh, to determine how exactly they will set up the incentive structures for their hospitals. So in that sense, there are differences across the regions. Um, but what is similar across all the regions is that there's been significant uh, centralization of hospitals, um, similar to what uh, Inga just described for Norway. 
closing down small hospitals, uh, amalgamating the structures, so you now have hospitals that cover different uh, sort of geographical locations, and, uh, and also a major investment scheme to establish new modern uh, hospital facilities, larger hospital facilities in all uh, five regions. And uh, the idea here is uh, to sort of restructure the way hospital services are being delivered, uh, to focus on a new way of doing uh, acute care services uh, with more sort of specialized uh, specialists, medical specialists being uh, brought into the game uh, up front, um, and also reorganizing along sort of functional lines, uh, so you have more patient, uh, uh, patient pathway type of thinking within the hospitals. The 98 municipalities uh, are responsible for public health uh, services, so prevention, health promotion, etc. Also uh, rehabilitation, so after discharge from hospital, after treatment episode, how do we get people back on, on their feet, so to speak? Uh, what are the types of services that, that are supposed to be delivered? El as I said, elder care, social care, etc. And another thing that was introduced with the reform in 2007, and which is uh, unique to Denmark and uh, also to Norway, or at least was to Norway until they removed uh, that part, is the uh, uh, municipal co-financing of hospital care. And the idea here is to, to, have to, uh, to make the municipi municipalities pay a certain fee uh, whenever a citizen from their municipality enters a hospital. And the idea is that that should give them an economic incentive to keep patients out of hospitals when it's not necessary to go to hospitals. And the thinking is very much uh, along the lines that uh, for a lot of elderly or complex uh, patients, it may not be necessary uh, to enter the hospital if you're just suffering from well, constipation or dehydration or something like that. It might be more beneficial and cost e efficient to have uh, local services. Um, so that's sort of the immediate uh, <coughs> prevention uh, incentive in this, and, and that's very much how the municipalities have been thinking about it. There are, of course, also potentially uh, a pressure for the municipalities to do sort of long-term prevention, uh, so more basic prevention, but, but that has not been, been uh, as clear since the benefits of that type of prevention fall in, in the very long run. Um, as in Norway uh, and Sweden, uh, there's a penalty for not and Finland uh, for not accepting patients that are uh, done with treatment in hospitals. And as in the other countries, that seems to work quite well in terms of forcing the municipalities to take back uh, patients. The incentive is a bit bigger in Denmark. Uh, it's not as big as in Finland, and it's, uh, it is bigger than in, in Norway. And for that reason, perhaps uh, we see that, that it, it, it tends to work better in, in or it seems to be a stronger instrument in, in Denmark and, uh, and Finland. Uh, certainly there's been a, a big sort of push at the municipal level to establish facilities to take back patients in, in Denmark. Right, so that's, uh, that's sort of an overall and very brief introduction to the Danish system and some of the differences uh, compared to, uh, to Finland. And that was the wrong keyboard, but this is it. Um, it's just an outline of the financing. Uh, it's just because you're discussing financing situation in Finland currently. And, and the only thing sort of to take out of this figure, I guess, is that it, even though it may look complicated, it's, it's uh, considerably less complicated than in Finland. Um, so we have people paying in to the states, uh, taxes uh, to the state level and to the municipal level. The state um, pays to the region's block grants, uh, so the regions are not able to raise taxes on their own. Uh, so that means the state has a lot of leverage on what goes on at the regional level, a lot of control. Um, they also pay block grants to the municipalities, and uh, then we have this uh, <coughs> co-payments uh, from the municipalities to the regions, um, and there's, there are also mechanisms for redistributing from uh, poorer, uh, from richer to poorer municipalities. That finances uh, the service uh, delivery uh, over here, so it, it's, it is uh, sort of less complicated. You don't have the occupational health uh, part that you do have in, in, uh, in Finland, so, so in that sense, uh, sort of the, the overall financing structure is a bit, a bit easier to uh, to deal with, and, and also it gives a lot more leverage from the state, from the, from the, for the central state to control things. Situation in uh, Sweden, 
20, uh, 21 healthcare districts, used to be county councils running healthcare in Sweden, but now it's a, a more mixed situation. Some have joined together into regions, in fact nine regions, and then one municipality, Gotland, uh, down here, also running a uh, hospital. And they're, pri uh, they're responsible for, as in Denmark, for both primary, secondary and tertiary care. So again, uh, an attempt to integrate across uh, primary and secondary care, across hospitals and, and primary care, and also uh, dental care. Then uh, 290 municipalities, uh, so still some smaller municipalities left in uh, Sweden as well as in Denmark. No major structural reform, although it has been discussed, as in Finland, for, for a number of years, uh, but uh, the Swedes have, haven't gotten around to it either for various reasons. Um, so 290 municipalities responsible for elderly care and in some cases also uh, home health care. So it varies uh, a little bit across the, uh, across the uh, country. Um, it's important to note that the, the 21 uh, health care districts actually have a fairly large uh, degree of autonomy to make decisions in terms of the uh, payment structure to the uh, to the hospitals and also to the uh, primary healthcare centers, uh, and and in in the whole to to sort of organize uh, the healthcare and the running of the healthcare. So in that sense, you could talk about Sweden not as one model, uh, as it's normal as it's, it's often portrayed in in Finland, I gather. Uh, but really, uh, in essence, it is 21 different models. Uh, some similarities across, uh, of course, but but also a lot of variation internally within Sweden, and and much less. Uh, ability for the state to sort of mandate uh, particular ways of doing things uh, than you'd find in, in the Danish situation. So more decentralized or regional control in, uh, in Sweden. Um, Swedish primary care historically, uh, since the 1970s, uh, primary care has been centered around these uh, primary health care centers. So similar to, to Finland, but different from uh, Denmark, Norway. Uh, Wide-ranging responsibilities uh, within the, these uh, primary healthcare centers, so a range of different services, including physiotherapists, uh, maternity care, uh, dietitians, etc. So really trying to integrate uh, across a lot of uh, different uh, functions. And uh, also a focus on preventive care, um, where each of these uh, primary healthcare centers have the responsibility to design and deliver preventive uh, care for a particular catchment uh, area. So in that sense, more of a, a planned uh, system. And uh, each patient, uh, at least were, uh, previously automatically listed to the primary health care center in uh, their particular uh, area. So, so that, that probably looks fairly familiar from a, from a Finnish uh, perspective. Um, so, so much for the introduction to the, uh, to the systems. Then we'll move on to discuss uh, choice and, and integration, um, and we'll split it up so we talk about choice of hospitals first, and then choice of primary care, um, and then integration issues. So hospital choice in Denmark uh, introduced in 1993, and this was a nationwide uh, choice of public hospitals. So once you had a referral to go to hospital, you could choose any uh, hospital within the country at the same level of uh, specialization. So it's not that you could go to, to the uh, highest level of specialization at any time, but you could go to sort of the same type of uh, department anywhere uh, in the country. And uh, it was introduced by law, uh, which is different from, from the Swedish uh, situation, where it was more sort of an agreement-based uh, introduction. And that made it mandatory for the, uh, for the counties and the regions uh, subsequently to, to, uh, to introduce this. And uh, how do patients find, find information to make their choice? Uh, well, there's been various attempts of establishing sort of national websites, national information bases, and currently it's called sundhedskvalitet.dk, uh, and you can go in there, you can pick your specialty, you can uh, pick the particular procedure you're interested in, uh, and then you can compare all the different departments that deliver this on, uh, on uh, items like uh, the waiting time, the amount of procedures being performed, uh, some quality data like hospital inquired infections, et cetera, et cetera, readmissions to, uh, to the department. It varies a little bit across the different uh, uh, specialties and so on, but the information is, is there to some extent. 
it's not very detailed uh, quality information, but at least some uh, basis to, to choose from. Um, this general uh, choice scheme uh, was supplemented with what we call extended choice schemes, which is really a waiting time guarantee introduced from uh, 2002. And the basic idea here is that if you as a patient is facing a waiting time of more than initially two months, uh, later one month, uh, then you'd have the right to go to some uh, private facilities, those that had an agreement with the uh, public uh, authorities. That has been changed uh, to a diagnosis guarantee, which is currently in place. So now uh, you have a, a guarantee of getting a di uh, diagnosis within one month. Uh, and if not, the, the regions have to sort of create a, a plan for you to go to private facilities or to one of the other regions to get your diagnosis. And then subsequently, there's a treatment guarantee for either one or two months, depending on, on the type of uh, uh, treatment that you need. Um, so, what are the experiences from the choice, uh, from the initial choice, the, the national choice scheme? Well, basically fairly similar to the Norwegian situation, uh, limited utilization, so not very many patients have, have opted to use uh, choice. They like uh, that it's there, but they don't like to use it, they don't like to travel necessarily, but it, they, they like to have it as a safety valve uh, and as a possibility. And uh, as in Norway, it's been used by some groups more than others. So there's a sort of social demographic uh, bias. It's the more educated. Uh, it's those that are in employment. Uh, it's not those with complicated, uh, complex uh, conditions and so on. And it's particular specialties. So like orthopedic surgery, eye surgery, uh, back, some back surgery, sports medicines, and things like that, uh, mostly. Um, you could say that the interest really in in the choice uh, and the choice reform and evaluating the choice reform has been limited uh, due to, to this amalgamation of hospitals that I talked about before. So when you get larger regions, choice is basically within the regions and since within the regions you are amalgamating the functions, uh, there's not really much, uh, much to choose from within the region. So in that sense, it, it's not very politicized in, in Denmark, the, uh, the general choice of, uh, of hospitals. And something similar could be said for Sweden, I guess. Uh, although uh, here, as I said, it was a choice was introduced uh, also in the uh, in the early 1990s. Uh, was it? Yeah, 1994, about 92. Yeah, uh, <coughs> by uh, by the county councils and due to agreements. Uh, and then subsequently, it's it's been followed up by a law. Um, and also in Sweden, uh, fairly limited utilization. Uh, and the counties, even though they had sort of entered the agreement, it appeared that they were sort of dragging their feet for a long time. So they were not very actively promoting uh, choice. Um, and uh, there was an issue of information availability also for, for making uh, the choice. So a lot of people felt that there was not sufficient information to actually make the choice. So it hasn't made a, a big impact, I guess, is the, is the take home message uh, from evaluating hospital choice in, in Sweden. And it's not highly politicized uh, anymore. It's just a, sort of a, a feature that's, that's built into the system. Sweden has a waiting time guarantee uh, as uh, Denmark, and uh, it also uh, allows access to the private facilities that have uh, contracts with the, uh, with the uh, regions. Now moving on to uh, primary care uh, choice, uh, which I guess is more central to the discussion in, in Finland uh, currently. Um, in Denmark, we've had to some extent uh, choice within primary care for a long time. Since back since the 1970s, there's been a choice between two public insurance plans, you could call it. Um, if you choose the first one, group one, then you're listing with a GP of your own choice but uh, you can switch uh, your GP at any time. You can do it electronically on the web, and it's, it's a fairly smooth process. It will cost you 190 kronos to do that, so it's a very limited uh, sort of nominal fee. Um, and the only sort of bottleneck to doing that is that a lot of the GPs are, are filled up, so, that, so they, they don't really have space for, for new uh, patients. Uh, so so that, that's really what's what's limiting the choice. Otherwise, there is a choice within this scheme uh, also. Uh, in this scheme, you'd have access to practicing specialists, uh, but only after referral. Uh, and uh, if you have a referral, then it's free to go to these uh, practicing specialists. 
So, so that's the first option. The other option that you have as a Danish citizen is uh, Group 2, where you have a free choice of, of GP at any time. So you can go to any general practitioner at any time. And you can go directly to practicing specialists uh, at any time. Uh, but you'd have to pay a co-payment. Uh, so you'd have to take money out of your pocket to, to pay for this. Um, and uh, if you look at the numbers, it's 98% of Danes that have chosen the first option. 2% have chosen the other option. And those are mostly people with sort of um, conditions that require them or that makes it beneficial for them to have direct access to, uh, to particular groups of specialists. Uh, and it's mostly in the, in the Copenhagen area where you have uh, more of the specialists uh, located. So um, choices existed, but it's important to note that unlike the Swedish situation, this is in a, in a context where it's not free to establish uh, 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 the uh, um, the clinics or the GP practices, so it's not linked to to that type of marketization as it is in in Sweden, uh, and that that that's important to keep in mind uh, if when you discuss these these matters. Um, the situation in uh, <coughs> in uh, in Sweden, um, well, uh, sort of uh, the development has been that the county councils uh, experimented from the late 1980s and early 1990s to allow patients to select uh, healthcare centers, preferred healthcare centers. And that was uh, gradually uh, expanded and then codified into law in 2010. Uh, so that's, that's where sort of choice or the, the vote was uh, firmly established as, as part of the, uh, the legislation in, uh, in Sweden. And what does that entail? Uh, yes, as I said, it, it entails that counties must accept the entry of private providers. Uh, so once you fulfill the requirements, uh, you have the right to establish yourself as a provider uh, of, uh, of primary health care services. And patients can then choose a primary care provider at any time. So you can go to any of these uh, primary care providers that have established uh, themselves within the country. So the core idea is to extend coverage and to create competition. So competition is, is an important part of the, uh, of the Swedish uh, reform thinking here. It, it doesn't necessarily have to be, as you can see from the Danish and Norwegian experience, but it, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a choice and it depends on the goals you want to achieve with the reform. Um, there's been debates, considerable debate afterwards of the consequences, particularly in terms of uh, equity and also efficiency. And, uh, We'll get back to, to that in, in a little while. Um, so again, a uh, rundown of, of the history from 92 and then to the codification into law in 2010. And uh, what that means then uh, now is that uh, all patients, as I said, can choose a primary health care facility freely. Each primary health care facility can open up wherever they want to open up. And uh, each county council then decides what each uh, primary health care facility must provide. And this is again an example of where the 21 regions have a lot of autonomy to make their own choices in terms of the model. And, and this is another example of where there's not one Swedish model, but, but several uh, Swedish models. In some cases, uh, only involving a single general practitioner. In others, uh, quite extensive with uh, a combination of many different types of uh, services. And uh, mono, uh, money follows the patient uh, according to a, re a reimbursement scheme. And that reimbursement scheme is also unique uh, to each of the 21 uh, regions. So they also have the autonomy to decide on how uh, these primary health care centers are being uh, paid. And in fact, that has... Uh, <coughs> resulted in 21 rather different, uh, well, somewhat different uh, reimbursement systems, uh, mainly based on capitation, though, uh, so, so that's a, a common feature, but uh, also with uh, various uh, varying degrees of uh, performance uh, remuneration, basically activity-based uh, remuneration uh, for, for primary health care centers. The capitation is weighted based on sort of age, uh, social econ uh, economy, and diagnosis, and uh, <coughs> the cost responsibility for the providers uh, differ. Uh, so the extent of services that are being uh, delivered uh, will will vary. And this somewhat uh, complex uh, figure, uh, with uh <coughs> which is probably uh, difficult to read. Uh, just exemplifies the variation of different remuneration schemes. So as you can see over here where you have the uh, capitation, 
most uh, are, are using that uh, as, as a core part of their remuneration. Then you have uh, some compensation for, for your, your in a center in a town or in a small town. And you have uh, various degrees of sort of uh, goal-based uh, remuneration. So you can mix and match a little bit, and that is, in fact, what, what you do. So many regions mix and try different reimbursement models. Uh, 20 regions give target-based reimbursement to have some degree of goals or targets built in. Um, there's a focus on, model, on trying to uh, develop models that give more responsibility to primary care. So an effort, a conscious effort to, to try to get primary care to take on more tasks, uh, to do more uh, services after discharge or more preventive services, uh, even more sort of uh, rudimentary uh, or, or more of more the, the simple uh, diagnostic services and so on. And that is common across uh, Denmark and, and Sweden and, and Norway, the, uh, the ambition or the attempt to move uh, part of the service delivery down to the primary care or the municipal, uh, municipal care uh, level. Um, um, yeah. Um, there's a new, the new patient law, the new development in Sweden is the new patient law from 2015, which allows patients to choose primary health care centers not only within their own regions, but also uh, in uh, different uh, regions. Um, whether or not that's really relevant to, uh, to many patients is debatable, but you can imagine people living sort of close to a border of uh, another region, for them it might be uh, relevant, or people with particular interests or, or needs. Um, what has been the evaluation of, uh, of this patient choice scheme in, uh, in Sweden? Uh, well, here are some of the, uh, the main points that have come up. Uh, the costs appear to be about the same, so it's not more costly to, to run this scheme compared to the previous scheme. There's been an increase in GP visits, um, and that uh, could be due to sort of partitioning into several visits, uh, and that may have to do with the re re remuneration based on activity, so it creates sort of an incentive to, to get people uh, in the shop several times uh, for, uh, if you see it from the, the primary healthcare center side, uh, but you don't know for sure if that's what's uh, driving it. Um, there's some evaluations have shown negative uh, equality effects, uh, whereas other evaluations have not, so it's still, uh, still up to debate in Sweden. Uh, some some are, are very adamant, adamantly saying that, that there are negative equity effects and others uh, claim that it's, it's more minimal. We have seen an increase, uh, qu quite a significant increase in the number of primary health care centers, uh, but they are not evenly distributed throughout the country. They are mostly located in the bigger cities and, uh, and uh, certainly not in, in, uh, in, the, in the smaller, smaller rural areas. Uh, and that, that has to do with the fact that, that in order to get economy within these primary health care centers, you need to have a, a certain uh, population base, uh, etc. But uh, all, all in all, it has provided a better geographical access, uh, obviously, again, more so in the big cities than in smaller cities. And uh, uh, if you look at the waiting times to get access, uh, there's been a tendency for a small uh, decrease in the, in the waiting times. So some beneficial effects and, uh, and not uh, too much of a, a cost concern. So that's for choice. Uh, choice of hospitals, choice of uh, primary care, and ob obviously we can discuss a lot more uh, afterwards and, and do more comparisons afterwards, but I'll move on now to, uh, to the integration uh, issue. And uh, here uh, the starting point uh, is, uh, or the starting point that I'll take is in a, in a paper that we published a few years back in the International Journal of uh, Integrated Care, uh, comparing uh, instruments, policy instruments to promote uh, integrated care in Denmark and Sweden. Um, and what we do in that uh, paper is uh, distinguish between regulation, agreements and guidelines as policy instruments. Um, and then we sort of note that obviously there are uh, other instruments that could be used, uh, mainly economic uh, incentives to promote integration and structural or organizational measures like the uh, 
structural reform in, in Denmark uh, and uh, hospital reform in, in Norway in order also to promote uh, integration. But, but our focus here is on what goes on sort of within uh, the structure as it is, uh, and we leave out the, uh, the economic incentives to a large uh, extent. So we compare across the two countries, uh, and this is uh, firstly looking at uh, regulation, so how much is mandated from the central level, or how does the state try to promote uh, integration, integration across the different levels through regulatory uh, measures. And uh, what comes out uh, of this first table is that uh, the state is, is a lot more active, in a sense, in, uh, in Denmark, and has more leverage to try to uh, to uh, force the uh, regions and municipalities to do things. Um, and one of the important tools, or the most important tool, is uh, this mandatory health agreement that uh, is being entered between the regions and the municipalities once in every election period. So once every four years, the regions and the municipalities have to sit down and discuss a number of details about how patients move back and, and forth across the, the administrative boundaries, how the division of labor is going to be between uh, the different administrative levels and so on. So, so it's a way of structuring a dialogue, a, a way of uh, making some firm agreements uh, across the different levels. These agreements have to be sent up to the state uh, for <coughs> approval. So in that sense, the state has, uh, again, uh, some control or at least oversight over uh, what goes on at the, uh, at the uh, decentralized uh, level. Um, then uh, in Denmark you also have mandatory uh, development of rehabilitation plans uh, and that takes place at the regional level. Uh, basically it's uh, hospital doctors that uh, when you get close to the time of discharge then you have to sort of think about what's uh, supposed to happen after discharge. Is uh, rehabilitation going to take place at the hospital level? So is more specialized rehabilitation necessary or can you leave it to the municipalities to do uh, mu uh, rehabilitation and so on. Sweden, uh, more limited sort of uh, uh, central, centrally mandated uh, regulatory uh, interventions in this area. Uh, some legislation requiring hospital doctors to, uh, to be in charge of, uh, or those that are in charge of treatment to inform the municipal authorities and general practitioners uh, about what's going on. So, so basically a general statement that that you have to have some degree of, of information across the different levels. You have to make that uh, available from the hospital side to the GPs and municipalities. That's contained also in the Danish health agreements. Uh, so the idea is the same. It's just more spelled out and more uh, sort of detailed in, in, in the Danish regulatory uh, framework, you could say. Um, agreements, uh, what types of uh, agreements do you have? Uh, well, a lot of different initiatives being introduced through agreements. Um, so, for instance, in Sweden, a national coordinator for psychiatry appointed by the Swedish government, national strategy for e-health, uh, so introducing e-based uh, communication measures uh, across the different, uh, across the different, or to, to, uh, to promote uh, integration and communication across the different levels. And, and there's a similar scheme in, in Denmark of a national sort of e or digital uh, digitalization strategy to uh, to develop uh, integrated platforms for sharing uh, information across the different levels it's not perfect uh, as it is in as as in as in finland there are some uh, hitches and uh, things always take longer than expected uh, but uh, at least in in denmark there, there there is sort of a a shared uh, platform uh, where you, uh, which you can enter both from the patient side and from the uh, provider side, and you can get access to sort of the patient records, not, not perhaps the detailed diagnostic tests and so on, but what has been going on at the hospital and, and GP uh, level. So there is a, a shared tool. There's also a shared, uh, a shared base for, for finding out about prescriptions and so on. So it's, it's getting there, but it's not, uh, it's not perfect. Various other types of agreements or agreement introduced uh, tools, um, like things like contact persons uh, between government regional authorities and between uh, regional authorities and municipalities and so on. Um, and for a while, uh, there was also a, a specific disease or disease specific uh, 
fee for services involving cross-sectoral work. Uh, this was introduced as a pilot for uh, di diabetes uh, patients, uh, but was largely abandoned uh, for, for not really, never really getting to work well. But, but the idea was there to try to, to use monetary incentives. Um, then uh, a third level of these uh, integration types of instruments, uh, so beyond regulation, beyond agreements, uh, are the use of uh, guidelines, uh, standards, and so on. Uh, and I think that that's really an area that has grown in all of the Nordic countries, and in fact in most healthcare systems. Uh, and, and the idea here, obviously, is, is to devise uh, sort of formalized descriptions of patient pathways uh, and the uh, things that are supposed to occur for pa two patients, uh, both within primary and secondary care. Um, in the Danish case, uh, starting with uh, can the cancer uh, treatment uh, area, but now being extended also to uh, the chronic uh, diseases. So these types of pathway descriptions have been developed for all the major chronic diseases, and they sort of specify what the municipalities are supposed to do, what the GPs, what the hospitals are supposed to be uh, doing. And uh, they become, in the Danish setting, part of this agreement framework. Uh, so the agreements would specify that you have to follow these, uh, that you have to implement these uh, clinical uh, or these uh, patient pathway guidelines for the chronic care uh, programs. And similar uh, line of thinking in Sweden, so what they call chains of care or patient pathway descriptions uh, developed in, in most counties. So again, more uh, inside the counties and more that way rather than top down. Um, and uh, various types of, of concepts of local care uh, developed in, in national action plans and so on. So it's just to highlight that that, that instrument is, is growing in importance and that it's uh, another way of trying to promote uh, integration across uh, the different levels. So, uh, yes, this is uh, reiterating a little bit about uh, what happened in Denmark after the reform. Uh, so at the overall level, you have uh, national agreements on the economy and you have a national budget law uh, sort of trying to to make sure that, that uh, the different levels are on the, on the same wavelength in terms, in terms of, uh, of, of keeping budgets and in terms of the economic targets. So that, that's at the very overall level uh, integration. Uh, then as I said, uh, between the regions and municipalities, the health agreements are uh, an important tool. And uh, the agreements are then followed up by a structure of joint committees, uh, working groups, uh, that have sort of ongoing discussions about the implementation of agreements and so on. So it, it's really an ongoing process and an instrument for, for, uh, for dialogue uh, and then supported by these national guidelines. What do these health agreements consist of? Uh, well, there are a set of mandatory uh, topics. So you have to deal with prevention, treatment and care, which is basically admission and discharge from hospitals, training, uh, rehabilitation, health, IT and work processes. And for those four main topics, you have to discuss uh, issues of division of labor, sharing uh, of knowledge, coordination of capacity, uh, involvement of patients and relatives, uh, equity in healthcare and documentation, research quality, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So all of these issues are mandatory for the regions and the mun municipalities to discuss, and uh, thereby you sort of force uh, a fairly uniform structure and a fairly uniform dialogue across the, the five regions and you have the state supervising what uh, goes on. The state has developed uh, national indicators uh, to track uh, developments uh, and also to be able to benchmark across the, the regions and municipalities and they uh, cover things like uh, the number of readmissions or what you could call preventable readmissions to hospital uh, and track the developments in, in those. Um, they cover the number of acute medical short-term admissions. Uh, so again, the thinking is that a lot of these really could be prevented if the municipalities had a better structure for dealing with it or if, if, the, if the two parties in, were in, in agreement about what to, be, uh, to do at different points. Tracking waiting times uh, for diagnosis, uh, waiting time for rehabilitation, um, looking at uh, <coughs> Uh, how the share of uh, specialized and standard rehabilitation plans work out, um, looking at things like 
the patient experience, collaboration and communication, so also using surveys and, and taking things from the patient perspective, uh, so getting a feeling for, for how they see the uh, integration across the levels. And uh, the degree of implementation of e-health standards uh, for communication across the, uh, the different levels. And the ambition is to, to extend this framework, so to gradually develop uh, more indicators to, to get even more control of uh, what happens at the decentralized level. Um, so we've covered this already, uh, the patient pathway programs uh, being developed uh, both for some of the highly specialized services and also for the chronic care uh, services. And e-health, uh, I've mentioned uh, the development of, of various types of tools and the integrated portal for, uh, for e-health. Um, how about within the regions? Uh, well, as I said, a major uh, investment schemes within the regions, building new hospitals, reorganizing the acute care functions within the hospitals, and reorganizing the hospital care along these uh, patient pathway lines uh, is the idea. Um, then another uh, instrument, you could say, is, is uh, starting to build organizational units that uh, uh, combine or that uh, cut across the regional municipal uh, line. So these would be things like uh, having uh, municipal units embedded within hospitals, so municipalities having uh, a group of persons uh, located within the hospital to, fa to facilitate the discharge and to facilitate the communication on particular patient groups. You have things like follow home arrangements, so people from hospitals following patients home uh, to their homes in the municipalities. You have uh, co-location uh, health centers, so not really health centers in a Finnish uh, definition, but, but a co at least a co-location of uh, um, uh, healthcare staff from the uh, regional level and the municipal uh, level. You have a lot of uh, telemedicine projects, uh, which really entail that you have specialists in hospitals working together with people in the municipalities to deliver services in people's uh, homes. And you have uh, training, regional, training from the regional side of the municipalities, the municipal staff, in order to upgrade their uh, skills. And then uh, finally, within the municipalities, you have a lot of developments also uh, after the 2007 reform in Denmark, where they got bigger and got more responsibilities for healthcare, etc. And uh, that, of course, made them start to, to work on, on establishing uh, both new structures and also training their staff, so upgrading the skill level and the capacity in the municipalities. Um, and uh, they are working a lot on home care uh, with sustaining citizen functionality in their own home. So basically new ways of doing a rehabilitation uh, based on, on sort of more holistic assessments of uh, patient functionality and integration within their, their home living situation. Um, using medical devices and aids to, to a larger extent uh, to assist uh, these, uh, these home-based uh, treatments or rehabilitation programs. And then uh, various types of telemedicine uh, programs. Um, and then uh, also developing new innovative ways of engaging with the civic society, so getting volunteers to uh, to help in, uh, in, for instance, doing uh, more activity for physical activity, social activities for, for people, uh, for elderly, etc. So um, quite a few things are being developed um, in addition to the more organizational things, uh, again at the municipal level, acute or temporary care units, uh, co-location centers, as I said, and various types of uh, new ways of doing assisted uh, living and uh, <coughs> uh, housing for the elderly. Um, by the way, uh, choice uh, is also uh, part of the, uh, of the uh, policies for elderly in, in the Danish uh, setting. So similarly to uh, Sweden, uh, a scheme has been introduced whereby the municipalities have to establish some way of, uh, of allowing uh, elderly to choose between either public or private uh, facilities. So that has been in operation for a while and it creates some contention with these integration uh, initiatives. Um, it's a problem that, that these integration ambitions sometimes conflict with the uh, economic incentives uh, within the system. Um, basically, in the Danish situation, you have uh, 
hospitals and GPs that are activity-based, uh, and that means uh, whenever they do more activity or take on more tasks, uh, they get paid extra, whereas the municipalities, if they are to increase their activities or do more, uh, they have to take it out of their core budget, they don't get more funding, uh, and that creates a lot of tension sort of between the two levels uh, in getting agreements on uh, how much new initiatives should be taken and where sort of the initiatives should be uh, funded from. So it's not a, it's not a perfect world uh, in spite of these uh, uh, agreements. Integrated care in Sweden, uh, and we're getting close to the end, uh, just a few more slides. Uh, so integrated care in Sweden, it's acknowledged as an important problem by both government agencies, other organizations, so across the different levels. Um, particularly for elderly patients with uh, multiple complications or comorbidities and so on, and that's similar, of course, in, in Denmark and, and Norway as well. Um, and uh, it's realized that the problem is, is uh, getting municipalities, primary health care centers, and uh, the hospitals, uh, the more specialized clinics, to work uh, together well. Um, and to some extent, the issue has been accentuated by the introduction of patient choice, uh, and that's because now you get a more fragmented system with um, a greater diversity of different providers, um, and you also get more emphasis on the economic incentives. So as in the Danish case, you have some that are activity-based, some that are sort of uh, block grant-based and so on. So you get sort of uh, not, not fully aligned uh, economic incentives to do integrated uh, care. Um, there have been no sort of significant national level initiatives since the EDL reform in 92. Uh, so again, uh, again sort of illustrating this, the Swedish situation with more autonomous regions and much, much more policy being driven from the uh, regional uh, uh, level. Um, but uh, a region reform might be introduced by the government, uh, by the new uh, government. Um, not sure how far they are. They've been talking about that for a number of times, but it hasn't really happened. No, but but okay. So we think it's going to be revived. Uh, so there might be be a, a reform there. And uh, the county councils and municipalities have uh, noticed the problem, and they've done a number of sort of attempts uh, to to create local reforms or no local initiatives to integrate across the uh, the different uh, levels. Some of those. Uh, are listed here. So, for instance, in Nortelje uh, region, um, they've tried to combine county councils with municipalities, so that's the full integration of the uh, governance structure within that area. Um, others keep them separate, but try with other means to, uh, to do things. Uh, for instance, Södertälje, vertically uh, integrated care for people with uh, multiple illnesses, um, multidisciplinary teams, um, and uh, things like uh, healthcare coaches or pilots uh, being introduced in different parts of the of the country. So there are a lot of sort of experiments, a lot of pilots uh, being uh, carried out. Many driven from the bottom up or from collaboration between regions and municipalities, uh, and no sort of grants uh, scheme uh, across Sweden to to achieve this. And uh, well, it's just. Uh, a picture of the uh, health expenditures in the different countries. Uh, you can see that, that they are actually fairly similar, Denmark, uh, Finland, and, and Sweden, if you take away the uh, long-term care uh, expenditures. Uh, but uh, that's a long discussion how to measure that, so we'll leave it for now. And uh, I'll end the presentation with a picture of some of my students in the sunshine in uh, Copenhagen. Well, thanks for now. <laughs>